Okay, Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 14 as we continue our study through the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas have been commissioned. They are now kind of wrapping up their first missionary journey. And the cities that they have been going to, they have been making their first stop, the synagogue or synagogues, plural, depending on the nature of the city. And they minister the gospel to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. When the Jews reject the gospel... Uh, in particular, he, he would move immediately to a Gentile populace. Uh, and as we looked at last week, he even told some of the Jews that they did not count themselves worthy to be recipients of the gospel. Now, none of us are worthy, but it was their own rejection of their own Messiah that Paul had in mind. And of course, everywhere Paul would go would be problems. And um, so... As he went, there would be an occasion in which the Holy Spirit would say, look, now it's time to move on to the next city, next village, uh, and talk to people. And so we are kind of working our way through some similar thematic material because we're talking about the Jews, Jesus as the Messiah, we're talking about the Jews rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. We have talked about the fact that God has not replaced Israel God has a covenant with Israel and will fulfill it. In the future, we will see much coming forward, as we just talked about uh, with, at the time when he makes himself known to them at the second coming, not to be confused with the rapture of the church. And then we have the subject of the Gentiles being grafted in. And so Paul's going to the Gentile people. He is... Uh, specifically called to the Gentile populations. And uh, as he is serving them, as he's ministering to them, we will have, in our view, uh, God's promise with Israel and also with the Gentiles during the church age. And so we're going to cover that part today. Uh, some of this is a little redundant. But as I mentioned before, I will mention again, until you can teach it, I'm going to keep telling you. And so take notes and let this stuff digest because we are always desirous of being those persons that are ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies within us when we are asked and when we go forth in the power and the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Father, we do thank you today as we open the Bible. Thank you that we have the Bible and we have it in our language and that we can study from the scriptures, learning the Bible and Lord, allowing your word to penetrate our hearts and our lives so that it affects our worldview, it affects our walk, and it affects our testimony. And so, Lord, we're looking for you to do great and mighty things in us, and exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, so that we might be a blessing to you as we serve and as uh, we would be then a blessing to those around us. Nourish us in your word, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Acts chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. And so in this particular city, immediately we notice that there are Jews and Gentiles at the synagogue. Now, earlier, we talked about the Jews, and then we talked about the proselyte. The proselyte were people that, under the law, were allowed to come into the assembly of the Jews, worship in the synagogues, uh, worship at the temple, uh, if you're dating yourself backwards, and they would be circumcised, they would be baptized, or ceremonially washed in a mikvah, and they would offer sacrifice to the Lord, and those individuals would then be allowed into the house of Israel, the household of Israel, and become what is called the proselyte uh, to Judaism. 
Now you have a number of people that are excited about the things that are going on with God, the things of the Lord, and they're hungering and they're thirsting, and God is the one that is preparing this harvest. And so people are coming in, very much like the Ethiopian eunuch, the first convert that was non-Jew listed for us in the book of Acts. And so remember, he had come from Ethiopia under the directive of the queen, and he went in and he apparently purchased a copy of the book of Isaiah as a seeker and he's on his way back and the Lord tells Philip, go and make yourself known to this guy as he's reading the book of Isaiah, he explains it to him and the guy gets saved and he's baptized right then on the spot and pff, immediately uh, Philip is removed from the scenario. And so we see this Gentile coming to faith. We saw the household of Cornelius, a group of... Uh, of people specifically gathered together to hear the word of the Lord under miraculous conditions. And now you're beginning to see not just one, not just a family, but in mass, Gentiles coming to faith. And so when they go to the synagogue in Iconium, which is in present-day Turkey, uh, they spoke the word of the Lord, and Jews and Gentiles believed. But... The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. So this is interesting. Today, if you go to Israel, you will find that there are Jewish people that will do the same thing. They will try to discourage the Christian. They will try to argue about Jesus being Messiah. And they will provide uh, many arguments. Well, they'll say, well, Jesus is a good guy and all, but, you know, they killed him. Well, we take them right away to their own scriptures, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and others, that talk about the suffering servant. He was bruised for our transgressions. Uh, in Psalm 22, he was pierced through his hands and his feet, etc. And we go through these passages with them, and, of course, they mock and they laugh. Uh, we remember an occasion on the Temple Mount when our guide, Nadine, said that if the Messiah comes and we ask him, have you been here before, then we'll believe. Well, Jesus has been there before. And of course, he will tell them indeed that he has been there before. They will believe. And so it's interesting to watch that in the eschatological timeline. Eschatological. Eschatology, the study of end times. And so depending on how we use it, it's pronounced differently. In this case, we're just talking about the timeline of the end days. All the things that the Bible tells us are going to take place. And we can watch those things unfold, uh, and we do study them, and we know what is going to be taking place. So they'll also say stuff like, well, Jesus is a prophet, but he wasn't the son of God. Well, the Bible says very clearly that he was the son of God. They'll say, well, he wasn't born of a virgin. He was just born from a young maiden. Well, hang on a minute. Uh, it's no miracle to be born of a young maiden. I know a lot of young girls that have babies. There's no miracle there. And so you go through these things, but they will try their best to discourage others. Some of our missionaries you support in Israel today, Lena Ledger, one of the two that are primary to us. Uh, she'll be here in a couple of weeks to talk with you, give her a, br a brief update. Uh, they just drove her out of a community. The Jews, uh, the Orthodox Jews, don't want them around. Stephen Apple and his wife Patricia, you've heard from many times. They'll be here again. Uh, they were literally driven out by stoning. The, the Jewish rabbis were picking up stones and throwing stones at them. Not, not an official stoning, but nonetheless, they wanted to practice the same thing. And they said, get out of our village, get out of our town. We don't want to hear from you. And so the Jews began to discourage the Gentiles and poison their minds against the brethren. So this was informational. They were trying to persuade them, oh, this can't be true and this can't be true. And yet the Lord knows those that are his will lose none of them. And as we looked at last week in the text, as many as had been appointed unto eternal life believed. And this process continues <clears throat> to this day. Therefore, verse 3, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And there's a couple of things there that we should note. Number one, when they 
face opposition, they don't retract. They don't recoil. They don't run away. Now, there will come a time and a place for that, and we'll talk about that in the concluding remarks today. Uh, But they were emboldened. They spoke even more boldly. And guys, if there's a time in our history, this would be the time that we should speak more boldly than ever. There is opposition to the truth. There are people out there that don't want to hear what you have to say. And it is no time for us to lay down, no time for us to run away. It is a time for us to stand firm against the adversity and against the adversary, uh, the, the devil that desires to dissuade people, turn them away from the truth and unto fables and lies and false doctrines in the last days. Now, the Lord was working with them, as we read in Mark and here in this passage, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. In Mark, we read about the Lord confirming the word with signs following. Well, that's interesting because, you know, we live in a day and age when we don't see that many miracles. We don't see that many signs and wonders. Uh, And frankly, uh, I can't tell you why that is. Uh, I suspect that in the sovereignty of God, he has chosen not to perform uh, many signs and wonders in the present era, in the present uh, geographical uh, part of the world, America, Uh, because of the signs and wonders movement, the people that have placed all their energy and all their effort on the signs and the wonders. Uh, I'll just caution you. If you see a poster, a banner, a TV advertisement that says, come to such and such crusade, it's a miracle crusade. It's a healing crusade and come and get healed. I would suggest you just don't bother going. Uh, Why? Well, if we study the biblical pattern, we realize that it was the word of God that was primary. They were preaching the word of God, and God was confirming the word with signs or wonders following. If we start worshiping the signs, we start worshiping the gifts, we start worshiping the wonders, we get very out of place. Uh, In fact, there is a movement that I call the Christless Pentecost. It's all about the signs and the wonders, and there is no proclamation of Christ. And I tell you guys, this is stuff to be avoided. But God does confirm his word with signs following. God does it according to his own good pleasure, in his own way. Uh, We're not cessationists. Cessationism. Okay, and there's another word I should define. Cessationism is the theological perspective that Uh, we believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for today. They have ceased. Thus the word cessationism. We're not cessationists. Uh, I should also define, I guess, for you, theological position. Theology is the study of God, the things of God, the doctrines of God, etc. So as theologians, we are not cessationists. But I also would tell you that I'm a bit afraid these days of identifying myself as a charismatic or as a Pentecostal and with all of the variations that are out there. Uh, it, it's very problematic. I believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and well on the planet Earth. I believe that he is alive and well in the church. I believe that he still does, as he sees fit, provide signs, wonders, healings, miracles, whatever it is that he wants to do, and we trust him for those things. We've seen several Uh, In the years that I've been in the ministry, which is, I think, I don't know, 38 years or so now, uh, we have seen many miraculous things, but it's certainly not something we can package. It's not something I can put out a poster and say, by tomorrow at noon, God will provide several new miracles. I mean, look, who's God in that scenario? Who's sovereign in that scenario? Can we really predict all that God is intending to do by tomorrow? Uh, Well, some things we have written in the Word, but we certainly can't package and market a crusade. And, of course, you know all the history and all the weirdness uh, related to those kinds of things uh, this day and in this age in which we live. Verse 4, the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. Well, this, again, inspires a conversation about division. 
Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword to divide. Truth is divisive. We're living in a period of history, especially in the West, when you don't want to say anything that's not politically correct. You know, you can't be right about anything. You can't be dogmatic about anything except for not being dogmatic about anything. So, you know, there's no absolutes. Are you absolutely sure that there are no absolutes, right? Uh, look, don't be afraid to tell the truth. This is who we are. This is what we believe. Uh, God is the one responsible for the results. Now, it doesn't mean that you should be a divisive person. It doesn't mean you should go out of your way to be divisive. But look, we tell the truth in love. And when we tell the truth, it is going to be divisive. It was divisive all the way back 2,000 years ago in the first century in the first visit of Paul to Iconium. We see it in Ephesus. We see it everywhere Paul went and included throughout the second, third, fourth centuries as the church continued to develop and grow. We saw a great deal of persecution. We see it to this very day. And that we need to be encouraged to tell the truth, to tell it in love and not be concerned about the fallout, not be concerned about the consequences, not be concerned about what some would call uh, hate speech or divisive. Uh, if you say that uh, homosexual marriage is wrong, you're right. You should say that. The marriage is in the Bible. It's a, it's a modeled uh, uh, worldview that comes right out of the book of Genesis and throughout the entirety of the Bible. You need to be able to tell the truth about the LGBT agenda. You should be able to tell the truth about all the things uh, in relationship to life. Uh, you should be able to talk about abortion and not be afraid to talk about abortion and the travesty, this horrible holocaust that's taking place all over the world today and in the West in particular. It's amazing when you begin to think about the number of people that we've killed for convenience. It's horrible. We need to take a stand. We need to be bold and strong in these days in which we live. And so in this case, the city was divided. Well, at least people knew where they stood. Uh, versus a, everyone wondering. Well, a violent attempt, verse 5, was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them. And so these guys are being threatened. Their very lives are being threatened. And they became aware of it, verse 6, and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, that region, and to the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. And so when this violent attempt to kill them took place, the Holy Spirit said, now is the time to move. Now, that's where you have to be sensitive. That's where you have to be following the leadership of the Lord. Just because there is a violent attempt to take your life doesn't mean that you should go into hiding. Sometimes you stand your ground. I can't help but think about people over the centuries that have stood their ground and their uh, blood that was shed has been as the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs and others that have uh, cited these things have proven it has become the seed of the church. Uh, this this uh, blood that was shed of people that took a stand. I can't help but think about a guy named Savonarola right now comes to my mind. Uh, when the Catholic Church wanted to kill him uh, because he was contending for the salvation of grace uh, by grace through faith alone, not of works, not through indulgences, uh, not through penance, uh, and the variety of things that the Roman Catholic Church added to the simple gospel message. They, at the gallows, told him, we now renounce you, we condemn you to death, uh, from the church, triumphant. Uh, and he said, from the church, you may, but from the church, triumphant, you may not. And then they hung him. Uh, of course not, because he was a part of the church, triumphant, and they didn't have the authority. There's so many people today that we can look back on. John Huss, uh, those people that were burned at the stake. Go back even further. Look at the times of Nero. Now, when Nero caught the city of Rome on fire and blamed the Christians, all the stuff that was going on in those days, uh, those are the people that became 
a high water mark for us in standing fast, and we should stand fast in these last days, as Paul and Barnabas did. Paul ultimately had his head taken, uh, but in this case, the Holy Spirit inspired them to move to the next place, the next village. You remember that the disciples were earlier told, when you go into one village, if they don't receive you, shake off the dust and move on to the very next village. There's many people out there that need to hear the truth. And so we have to be very sensitive when we're ministering to people that we understand whether it is the Lord would have us to stay and contend as the disciples did earlier. Uh, they stayed a long time and contended. And when the day comes, when the contending is over and we say, okay, Lord, uh, this is on you. And so you have to be sensitive to the leadership of the Spirit as you move forward in the proclamation of the gospel. You've heard this expression many times, uh, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. And so as we go forth with the gospel, we have to be sensitive to where God is with people. We don't want to push them further and further away by being uh, uh, too aggressive. What we want to do is allow the Lord to do the work. And so we will plant seed, another will water, but God is the one that gives the increase. Amen? And so they were preaching the gospel there in all the cities of Lystra and Derby and in all the region of Lyconia. And this would, of course, bring to uh, a close, that, and we'll see some more information before it's completely finished in the, the storyline, uh, when Paul then returns back to Antioch, Syria, the end of the first missionary journey. So now let's go to uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I would take you guys to this passage uh, because we are dealing with Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles and how that God, who has a present covenant with Israel, had a covenant with Israel, and will continue to have a covenant with Israel, has not replaced Israel, but is allowing Gentiles to be grafted into the root and fatness, the promise, the blessing that God gave to Israel. And so much of this you know, but being able to work your way through it, biblically, scripturally, giving support, giving an answer to everyone that asks of you, uh, you should know these things. Uh, verses that we omitted earlier when we were talking about replacement theology. For those of you weren't, that weren't here, replacement theology is a theological position suggesting that God has replaced Israel with the church. Well, that is not true. Uh, God has a covenant with Israel. He will bring it to its fullest fruition in days to come. When he does split the sky and when he does come back and every eye sees him, all of Israel at that time shall be saved. God will restore Israel. They will be the head of the nations. Jesus will rule as king of Jerusalem, king of Israel, and ultimately king of the world for the millennial reign, the thousand years that is in the future where Jesus will physically be here restoring all that he promised to Israel. And so we do not believe in replacement theology. We are premillennial in the context that we are a people who believe that the, the millennium has not yet started, the thousand-year reign, and that it is in the future, and that we will reign with Christ during the time that he fully restores Israel. So we are not replacement theology. But in the context of the timeline, we are the church and we are living in a period of history known as the church age. The church age is from the time of Pentecost until the time of the rapture. And so during this period of time, God is allowing for Gentiles to be grafted in to the root and fatness of the olive tree, the olive tree symbolic of Israel. And as we are, we are participants in what is, in effect, the Jewish religion we now call Christianity. Now, that messes people up. They go, wait a minute, Christianity and Judaism are not the same. 
That would be true if you're looking at the modern day Jewish faith. If you're looking at those that have rejected the Messiah, there is a, quote, Judaism of the day. But that is not true Judaism. That is a group of people that have rejected the Messiah, that are still trying to live under the law, under the old covenant dispensational rule. And those individuals today are antichrist. We, as a people of God today, Christians today, are believers in Jesus who is the Messiah of Israel. And every Jewish person that comes to faith in Jesus as Messiah does not cease being a Jew. They believe in the Messiah and therefore move from the old covenant into the new covenant relationship. And the new covenant relationship is where you and I live today. We are participants in the blessing, the promise, the inheritance. Christ is our inheritance and in fact we are his. And we, the Bible says, are joint heirs with Christ. And so everything he gets, we get. And everything that he will give and has promised to Israel, he will get and therefore we will get. So we are recipients of the root and the fatness and the blessing and the promise that God made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. We are believers in the Messiah that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob looked forward to. And those that were in the era of the law and the prophets, all of them looking forward to, in faith, a Jewish Messiah coming onto the scene, we believe in that Jewish Messiah. We are grafted into the promises. And so we don't replace Israel. We are recipients of the blessing of Israel and the blessing that many of the Jews today have rejected and therefore forfeit. And so let's go back to verse 11, Romans 11, verse 11. Quickly walk through this part of the chapter that we omitted intentionally a couple of weeks ago. When we were talking about replacement theology... Uh, we dealt with the fact that God has not forsaken his people Israel. Now today, with focus on how God is grafting in the Gentiles and the gospel going to the Gentiles and Paul's apostleship to the Gentiles. And why? Because as we study through the book of Acts, we will now see that there is a major shift uh, to a Gentile focus. And that's where we are in our study. And so, beginning in verse 11... Talking about the Jews, Paul arguing that God is not finished with them, says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, is it over? And he answers, certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And so now salvation coming to the Gentiles is provocative to the Jews. They're kind of trying to figure out who are these people and why are they interested in our Messiah? And why are they interested in our prophecy? And why are they interested in the land of Israel? And why do these people come here to visit all the time? Jealousy. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, that is the, the Gentile nations, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. In other words, there is a day coming when they will experience the fullness. How much more their fullness. Now he says to these that are listening, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. In other words, I'm putting focus on that right now. I'm talking to Gentiles about the Gentile uh, ministry that God has called me to, to proclaim the Jewish Messiah so that you might become a recipient of the promises and the blessings of Israel. And therefore the Jew first, then to the Gentile, the same message, the same gospel, the same belief system, the same faith walk, no matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, when you come to Christ, it is exactly the same doctrines. It is exactly the same way that you live in the church age, the dispensational change of Old Covenant to the church age. You know that. Now, if you're not familiar with the term dispensation, I guess I'm in definitions today. Dispensation just means an administration. And so there's an, a change of administration. There's a change of the way God is dealing with man. 
from the old covenant, we're under the law. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But when Christ has come, you are no longer under the law. And so therefore, we move from the old covenant written in stone to the new covenant written into the heart. Okay? You guys understand that. I know that most of you do. And if you don't, uh, well, it's a good chance to come on a Wednesday night and ask lots of questions. Amen? Now, if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? This resurrection that I mentioned a few minutes ago when we were singing together. If their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, which is glorious, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? All the more glorious. It's going to be a, a resurrection. It's a miracle. Now, if the first fruit which is the individuals that were first called, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Remember when God called Abraham, it was a one-sided covenant. Abraham didn't have participation in it. God put him to sleep, remember, and he went through as a torch of flaming fire and uh, smoking burning fire, and he, and he had made this covenant ritual with him, and this covenant was a one-sided covenant that God made with Abraham and to his descendants forever. We've covered that, haven't we? And so now, this covenant is the Abrahamic covenant that he's talking about. And through you, he said, all the nations, plural, shall be blessed. And it is through his seed, Abraham's seed, not as of many, as all of his descendants, but through his seed as of one, that is, Christ himself, the Messiah himself. And so if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. That is, the first fruit symbolic of the whole. So God has set apart Israel unto himself as holy. By the way, it, it freaks me out when people come to candlelight and they go, why do you guys have an Israeli flag in your church? That just tells you how illiterate Christians are today because they don't know that Christianity is a Jewish religion. They don't know that we're supposed to support Israel. They're not, they don't know that we're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, we don't talk about that stuff in church anymore, mainly because the majority of Christians today are not being taught the Bible. They're being taught things about the Bible and little sermons and fun things and a lot of good stuff, but not the whole counsel of God. And so for somebody will say, I'm kind of offended that you have an Israeli flag in your church. I mean, they're all a bunch of antichrists. I'm, I'm offended that you have a menorah. They don't even understand the, the symbolisms of the menorah and what God is doing with them. And what God is doing with Israel now, that in Israel in part is under a spirit of blindness, but there is a day coming when he will open their eyes and every eye will see him and all those that pierced him will mourn because of him. Amen? Do you guys know, know this, right? Amen. All right, say amen a little bit. Amen. Okay, be like kind of a charismaniac Pentecostal church for just for a minute to help me out. Hey, thank you. <laughs> baby, baby, woohoo! Is right. Somebody get a hanky. Now, if the lump is holy, the root's also holy, so are the branches. Now, the branches being the offspring, the Jews. And if some of the branches were broken off, that is, the Jewish people, some of them are under a delusion. They're broken away from the root and fatness because of their unbelief. If some of the branches were broken off, and you, Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them become a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. In other words, don't be anti-Semitic. Don't hate the Jews. Don't reject Israel. God hasn't. God is doing something with them, and we need to know it. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Who are you boasting against? The root. And who is the root? The seed of Jesse, the son of David, the Messiah, the seed of Abraham. He is the root. Do we know that? He is the Netzer. That's why he's called the Nazarene, not just because he was born in, uh, in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth, but the word Netzer that we have from the Old Testament in the Hebrew language has to do with the branch. See, he's the outgrowth of the blessing, outgrowth of the promise. Do not boast against the branches, plural. If you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, well, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. I, that attitude part I put in. 
And if I was a valley person, you know, then I'd even have to do something else. But I can't figure out how to make my neck move the way they... I don't know how they do that. Man, it's weird. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And his answer, well said. But why? Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. In other words, look, what are you doing? You anti-Semites, what are you doing? You replacement theologians, what are you doing? You're boasting against the branches. Don't you remember who supports you? Who supports them? You are wild by nature. You've been grafted into the root and fatness of the tree, but you do not become the tree. You guys following this? Okay, about 35% getting it. Okay, you don't become the tree. God hasn't replaced the tree. You're grafted into the root and fatness of the tree. You get the benefit of what God is doing with Israel. You understand that? No replacement theology. Gentiles are grafted in. And those Gentiles that continue in unbelief, that say, I reject this, I don't want nothing to do with it, they're going to be cut off. They're not going to have any blessing. They're not going to be able to be participants in the things of the Lord. Okay? And so what is he saying? You stand by faith. Continue to stand by faith. If you don't stand by faith, you're going to be cut off. And he's telling this to the Gentile populations. Now, for those of you that get a little sensitive here, he's talking to a populist group. But if you were to deal with this on an individual basis, I want you to know that if you have been born again, you will never be cut off. Now, that's on an individual basis. By grace through faith alone in Christ alone. You are born again by the Spirit of God, by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. The Bible tells us that he has given you eternal life and you will never perish. Jesus words himself. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So if he gives you eternal life, he's never taken it away. Jesus himself said it. I'm just going to quote Jesus. I will give them eternal life and they will never perish. I don't know about you, but I'll take that to the bank. Amen? So, He's talking in mass. There is a day coming when the times of the Gentiles will come to an end. There is a day coming when God is not going to be focusing on the Gentile populations in the gospel. The times of the Gentiles will come to an end. The ages of the Gentiles will come to an end. All of that stuff we know about in eschatology, right? Study of the end times. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity toward you, goodness, If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. Now you understand that. See, it's by faith, by faith, by faith. Don't boast against the tree. You don't support the root. The root supports you. They also, if they do not continue in unbelief. Now they also, who's they? The Jews. They also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able, more than able, to graft them in again. We know he's more than able, and he will do it. We know that when we read the scriptures. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree. See, notice you don't become the tree. How much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The fullness of the Gentiles. Until there is a day coming that the shift will be made again, another administrative change. And then, verse 26, and finally, so all of Israel will be saved as it is written. A deliverer will come out of Zion and so forth. So all of Israel shall be saved, okay? Okay, so let's go through my points quickly. Um, They're in your bulletin, and if I run out of time altogether, at least you've got them there. Um. Number one, the Jews were not, nor are they preempted or prevented from coming to the Lord during the church age. You'll note that there were many Jews that got saved during the ministries of Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and others. 
uh, there, there are many Jews are still being saved today. So blindness in part has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then, so right now we know there are Jews still being saved. Number two, it was the unbelieving Jews who stirred up the Gentile crowd against the apostles. And we know that. The unbelieving Jews are the ones that stirred up the crowd. And I will admit there are many unbelievers today that are Gentile that are stirring up the crowds against the church. I don't have to tell you that. Number three, we are called to pursue peace, but not at the expense of telling the truth. Uh, I don't have to explain what that means. We covered it already. Number four, the persecution did not dissuade the apostles it both emboldened and persuaded them to spirit-led, lengthier engagement. Spirit-led, lengthier engagement. Somebody wants to debate with you? Don't be afraid. Now, you have to be spirit-led in this context. You have to be sensitive. God, are you leading me to pursue this, or should I let this go? And, and give God opportunity to water the seed and then bring to fruition. One plants, another waters. God giveth the increase. Amen? Number five, amen? Amen. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Number five, Paul and Barnabas did not pursue the life of ministry because it was easy or provided creature comfort, unless they were American pastors and they get to have all the fancy stuff. <laughs> they served the Lord as motivated by love and as the result of a divine calling. Guys, by the way, look, uh, the Western pastor, like myself, I mean, you guys take good care of us. I'm thank I thank the Lord for that. I really do. Uh, but you don't go into the ministry for the money. There's a lot more money to be made outside of the ministry. And uh, even in America, pastors don't get paid what other persons in executive roles that, that do what pastors do today get paid. However, we don't do it for the money. And look at Paul the Apostle, for example. Uh, look at these guys. Not only did they not do it for the money, it cost them their very lives. And if that's what needs to be the case for you and me, then so be it. Amen? Number six, the threat of death as a resulting self-protection is not condemned in Scripture. Um, we are not called to unnecessary martyrdom. Covered that. Uh, so there is a time and a place. Hey, step aside. Let them uh, lower you down in a basket on the outside of the wall. You, you know these stories. And from Romans 11, we learn uh, five things I want to highlight. Number one, Gentile believers are invited, not entitled, to partake of the blessings God has promised Israel. We stand by faith. We're not entitled. We live in an entitlement generation. We live with uh, ad nauseum entitlements. Uh, and come on, uh, this is this like everything else. We're not entitled. This is a gift by God's grace that we receive by faith alone, uh, in Christ alone. Number two, Gentiles do not replace Israel as though we become the tree. We are grafted into the root and fatness of the olive tree, grafted into the root and fatness of the olive tree. We don't become the tree. Number three, as Gentiles, we are not to boast against, quote, the natural branches, in quote, and that is Israel. We're to support Israel. We're to pray for Israel. It doesn't mean that we believe that everything they're doing today is right. It isn't. Not everything they're doing is right. But we are to support Israel. We're to pray for Israel. Why do we go to Israel? Why do we take people to Israel every year? It's not just so you can have a really cool vacation, because for many it is. It's because we are financially supporting Israel. We are prayerfully supporting Israel. We are learning Bible prophecy. This is the greatest income stream for Israel today, tourism. And so we're supporting Israel when we go there. We should support Israel. Number four, we are all, whether Jew or Gentile, supported by the root. That is the root of Jesse, Jesus himself. And in the root and fatness, the promises and the blessings that God gave to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob and his descendants after him. And through Abraham, we learn all the world shall be blessed. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Number five, Israel's rejection is temporary and will eclipse the fullness of the Gentiles at the second coming of Jesus. All of Israel shall be saved. I stopped reading uh, because we did cover those verses earlier in Romans 11. You'll see that by the time the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, 
that all of Israel shall be saved. That will happen at the time of the second coming. Zechariah 12, he pours out on them a spirit of supplication. They look on him whom they have pierced. After the battle of Armageddon, Ezekiel 38 and 39, I know some people don't like to think that the Magog invasion is the one and the same. I believe that it is. It, the Bible says very definitively, if you read carefully Ezekiel 39, that at the end of that war, when Jesus himself comes to rescue them, they will forever see him. They will never have their eyes blinded from him. They will know their Messiah. And, and the Bible even says in Ezekiel 39, look this up for yourselves later, that he will no longer hide his face from them anymore. That puts that at that moment because it is then when he splits the sky. Jesus is coming again, you guys. He is coming as the resurrected son of God. He is the fulfillment of all the Bible prophecy concerning his first coming, and he will be the fulfillment of all the Bible prophecy concerning his second coming. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world through you and by his spirit today, but he is coming in a day when he's going to let his feet land on the Mount of Olives. He's going to reign from the throne of David, and we're going to reign with him. And I'm so glad. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys.